I'm going all in. All right, besties. I think that was another epic discussion. People love the interviews. I could hear him talk for hours. Absolutely. We you crush your questions. Admit it. We are giving people ground truth data to underwrite your own opinion. What did you guys think? That was fun. That was great. I'm going all in. Dave Ricks, welcome to the All In interview. Great to be here. Yeah, we uh, had dinner together a couple of months ago and have been in touch. And obviously, I'm really excited to talk to you uh, today about the work you're doing at Eli Lilly. So just for the audience, Dave is the CEO of Eli Lilly, which is the world's most valuable pharmaceutical company and the leader in the GLP-1 uh, drug market, which some analysts have said could grow to as much as $150 billion in annual revenue over the next 10 years. Really kind of an extraordinary story. And Dave, you became CEO of Lilly. In January 2017, when Lilly had a market cap of just $70 billion, following a year of $22 billion in revenue and three and a half in operating income. And today, Lilly's market cap is an astounding $878 billion, and the company's projected to do $46 billion in revenue and $15 billion in operating income this year. And few companies in history, I'd say, have seen such an extraordinary rise in revenue, profit, market value at this scale. Maybe NVIDIA recently, which I'd say is the only company that kind of beat your performance in recent years. But I don't know of any that are not founder led, maybe Satya running Microsoft, but it took him a little bit longer. <laughs> and so today, I'm really excited to talk to you about the work you're doing at Lilly, the chronic health problem of obesity and diabetes, GLP ones, and what's happening in that market, what those uh, products do, and the business of Eli Lilly. So thanks so much for being here, Dave. Yeah, excited to be here. I'm I'm a big fan of the pod, so I'm I'm excited to be on. That's great. Um, sorry you don't yeah. get uh, harassed by the other three today. It's just me. Uh, so this is a, an extended <laughs> science corner for all the nerds at home that wanted it, with a, a deep dive on a on an amazing business. So we'll start off by talking about the the, the chronic health epidemic of obesity. According to the CDC, seventy four percent of Americans are now overweight or clinically obese. Your statistics might be different. This condition is driving what is arguably the largest health epidemic in human history. Obesity and all the associated diseases like type 2 diabetes have so many negative health implications for our populations. And this has risen dramatically over the past 50 years as becoming a global problem. So let me pull up a couple of images we can use as we have this conversation here. Dave, and we'll dialogue about this, but obviously what humans eat what we consume has changed dramatically, particularly here in the US, we've seen the American diet uh, shift to a much more kind of caloric, lower nutrient density diet over the last 50 years. The mm -hmm. average daily calorie consumed by Americans since 1961 has driven up from 2800 to about 3600. And you know, that sounds like a small number. But when you add it up over 365 days a year, it leads to a pretty dramatic increase in in obesity rates. This is a great chart that shows how the availability of calories and the consumption of calories in a population significantly correlates with the rate of obesity mm -hmm. in that particular country. And the United States obviously has the largest caloric supply of any developed nation and also has the highest percentage of people that are overweight or obese. And I would argue that many of the improvements that we've seen in agricultural technology and many of the systems um, in, in food that have made calories cheaper have resulted in this kind of surplus problem that has led to an obesity epidemic. And just looking at the US rates over the last 20, 25 years, you know, we see today, as I mentioned before, 75% of people overweight or obese. And in this particular slide, we're showing 35% of obese and severe obese to Today, 51% of Americans are either obese or severely obese. Really extraordinary. And this is not just in the US. As the calorie supplies increased around the world, we see obesity rates climbing in every developed nation from Brazil to Mexico and now even recently in India. And so this is becoming a global problem. And I think, you know, Dave, maybe you could talk a little bit about the scale of the problem. I think You've highlighted a lot of this in your investor presentations, and, and this is one of your slides that you've used. So maybe you can kind of share how you guys forecast the obesity epidemic and, and the effect it's having worldwide. Yeah, that's a great backgrounder uh, to get us kicked off. Uh, you know, one thing, just pointing out on the data you showed, some people notice a difference in the caloric intake numbers versus the um, kind of the macronutrient, micronutrient story. You go back, yeah. Mm. So like 
the the severe obesity in particular kicking up you know on the next slide there um yeah kicking up almost doubling right in the last 20 years whereas caloric intake certainly isn't moving at that same rate so you know i think as we think about the problem of course um excess calories versus expenditure is a key part but so is probably the ultra processed food story which you didn't have data on there but it is yep. you know i think in the us we're, we're now eating Two thirds of our calories in our country are ultra processed. Yeah. And that compares to like 35% in Europe. So that's got to be part of this equation as well. But no matter the cause, like if you go to that first slide I had, we now see about a, a billion people on the planet with clinical obesity or overweight. And as you're pointing out, uh, probably that's um, going to grow a lot more in the developed or developing world than the developed world. There's a function of wealth accumulation and um, surplus uh, food uh, abundance, basically, that will drive this. India, I think, is 11% of the population's obese, but projected to go as much as 30% in the next 20 years. So on that population base, that alone would would add almost half a billion people um, to this, this chart. Yeah, so your projection is obesity worldwide will affect about a billion people by 2030. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem with obesity is that it has an effect on many of uh, the, the, the systems of the human body. Maybe you can highlight kind of how obesity, uh, you know, causes many of the chronic health conditions and ailments that simply weren't around maybe 100 years ago, but are certainly becoming far more frequent today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first order effect, of course, is on your metabolic processes in here, you like, like cardiovascular disease, how we process lipids and other energy sources that leads to cardiovascular disease and its um, other associated risks like stroke. Um, I, I mean, there's a pretty new disease here called under the liver disease, which is what used to be called NASH is now confusingly called MASH, but it's the same disease. It's fatty liver disease. And 30 years ago, like clinically, you couldn't really find this in the adult population. Hmm. And now it's one of the most common conditions uh, obese people suffer from. And it ends up in fibrosis of the liver. And as you know, like we have a lot of every organ that's important, we have redundancy and except the liver. So when your liver goes south, it's a bad news story uh, for human health. Transplant is, is the only escape from that. Um, and we've got some that new used, data that on used our to drug. be a, that used to be a disease limited to severe alcoholism, right? Exactly, and and that's yeah. just, the Nash word is actually starts with non-alcoholic, yeah, fatty liver. Yeah. So, but now there's much more um, obesity-driven fatty liver than any other cause, uh, as you're pointing out. But it results in transplant and terrible uh, outcomes long term. So, so much yeah. of the, the health problems, the chronic health issues that we deal with as a modern society are probably rooted, many of them are rooted in the obesity epidemic. Yeah, so 230 yeah. diseases have, have been yeah. connected. And you have these, these ones that are more like directly because of the caloric imbalance and fat accumulation. And then you have these the ones in blue are sort of like derivative, like obstructive sleep apnea, that's like 14 million Americans ha have CPAP machines. And why? Because there's so much um, fat accumulation around your respiratory system, you, you wake yourself up at night to breathe. And GERD, of course, that's, you know, reflux, et cetera. So these are like more the second order effect. And then interestingly, you've got the mood anxiety pieces here. And there's an interesting study done by Epic, you know, they're the big health record company. Yeah. Which is retrospective and not tightly controlled, but it showed people on GLP-1 drugs, incretins, had remarkably lower rates of cl new clinical depression diagnoses, which is an interesting thing as well. So a lot of, a uh, lot of impact. Uh, uh, yeah. And then obviously obesity. like type two diabetes itself, which is an inability for the body to respond with an appropriate amount of insulin when there's glucose in the blood itself has a number of follow on effects. Obviously, diabetes, as, as many know, um, has become on its own a, a chronic health epidemic. Uh, it can cause nephropathy, uh, so damage to the kidneys, which has a significant effect on our ability to regulate protein in our body. Diabetic retinopathy, hemorrhaging in the eyes uh, that ultimately can lead to, to blindness. So having too much blood sugar and not having an ability to produce enough insulin to bring down the blood sugar level can can lead to all these chronic health effects. 
which have yeah, obviously terrible been for you. a major problem. Yeah. And those are the microvascular ones. There's the, I mean, the, the risk of heart attack if you have type two diabetes is four times people who don't have diabetes. Yeah. So you also have the macrovascular uh, events, stroke, heart attack. Okay. So the treatment for diabetes used to be insulin, right? And insulin, uh, and if I remember the history of Eli Lilly correctly, uh, Eli Lilly was the first American company uh, to produce insulin, which was done with initially processing, I, I believe, pigs or cows uh, to, 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 to get the insulin. Yeah. Both? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting story. So we were the first company, period. Um, there's a Danish company, Novo, who's our competitor in this space. We can come back to that because it's not a coincidence. That the I, I remember the history of the, of the relationship. It's a really interesting history between the two companies. Yeah, but yeah. kind of yeah. intertwined. Yeah, but we we had a like our head of science uh, met with Toronto, this researcher up there who discovered the mo the mechanism of insulin, but they couldn't make it into a medicine. We produced the process that made it available at scale. Which, as you're pointing out, was derived from like a lot of the you know the history of our industry was like taking things in nature and refining them into medicine, and that was the case with insulin. We took something in nature, the pancreases of slaughtered uh, meat animals, uh, really cows and pigs, and essentially refined out of that the protein, which is insulin, and that was the case until 1981 where uh, we had partnered with Genentech to do another first, which is create the first biotechnology product on planet Earth, which was human insulin made in a, in a bacterial cell. Yeah, so in, in so, that case, yeah. that was the first recombinant biologic product, right? It was putting the, yeah. genetic, the genetic code from human DNA that codes for human insulin into an E. coli bacteria. And then you put that E. coli bacteria in a giant vat, and just like we ferment wine, we put sugar in and it started to make insulin. And that's how we make insulin around the world today is through that recombinant Still, process, right? Yeah. That's right. Still. And that was the so, first DNA-based product uh, made. And it solved a problem because we were actually, we had, we had uh, per the obesity discussion, rising type 2 diabetes rates. It used to be type 1 diabetes, which is the childhood form that's really an autoimmune disease, yeah. um, was most of the diabetes that needed insulin. But as this, uh, you know, abundancy grew and people got heavier, we saw earlier and earlier onset type two diabetes, which is the adult form. Right. And we, we were worried we were going to run out of animals to slaughter an animal pancreases to refine. So it wasn't just a cool science thing. It was actually solving a pretty big public health problem, which was the risk of scarcity of insulin. Yeah. Yeah. And so look, I mean, biotech to the, to the rescue, and we'll talk more about biologic drugs mm. and all the other things that that have been addressed with recombinant systems, uh, meaning we put DNA in microbes and get those microbes to make a protein for us. And obviously, there's yeah. been a lot of advancements in that space. It's probably worth you know hundreds of billions of dollars today. But um, yeah. let's let's fast forward to what happened after insulin. It sounds like in the history of of research into diabetes and understanding some of these underlying mechanisms. Uh, there was this discovery of GLP-1 at one point. And l let me try and explain it, and you tell me if I get it right. But okay, GLP-1, it sounds like, is a protein that is expressed by L cells. These are little cells in the small intestine of a human. So when we eat food, those cells recognize that there's food in the intestines, and they pump out a protein called GLP-1. And that protein goes into the bloodstream and flows all over our body and turns on and off different parts of different cells, telling them, hey, there's food in the, st in the intestines. So it tells your brain, don't be hungry. But it also has other effects like secreting insulin, getting cells to make insulin. And as a result, GLP-1 is what's called a hormone. It's a regulator of all these different cells to do things when our intestines are full of food. Is that an accurate way of kind of describing what a GLP, what the GLP-1 protein is? Yeah, that was perfect. I would just step back one step though and say there's a broad, there's like a super family of these things. And this is going to come up later in the, when you talk about the drugs, yeah. which we call incretins. And this was derived from a, a, even earlier on your chart here in the seventies, they observed that if you give someone nutrients intravenously, meaning it bypasses the GI system, that you have a higher spike in glucose than if you give it via the GI tract. So right. that's a curiosity, right? Which is why is that the GI tract was doing something and they call that the incretin effect. 
And right. later we found out that there's a whole family, a super family really of these hormones signaling tools that are telling your body when you're fed to do different things. That makes a lot of sense because to survive as humans, feeding is like one of the top three essential processes next to breathing and other things. And so there's a lot of redundancy, but also uh, different hormones for different chores. And GLP-1 was the first one that was made into a drug. And so but in 1987, yeah. it was discovered that GLP-1 actually stimulates insulin production, insulin secretion. And, and then it was isolated and um, ultimately, I, I mean, maybe you can tell us the history. I think there was a story about Novo Nordisk and Novo having some, um, some role in some of the early work with GLP-1 versus Lilly and, and tell us a little bit about the history and like what took so long for GLP-1s to go from, hey, it stimulates insulin secretion in 1987 to kind of getting these first drugs on market for GLP-1s. Yeah, it's a great question. Both companies played around with this mechanism right after that paper was published in 87. And as I've said, back to the insulin story, it's not really an accident because we were two companies very focused on making peptides and, and diabetes, right? So this was a good thing to chase. But GLP-1 in its native form is I'm not sorry, usable pe pe as a drug. Pe peptides are a small molecule, a small protein, right? Just, just to a smaller be clear. protein, yeah. Less yeah, amino yeah. acids in a chain, yeah. um, which is what we call GLP-1, really. It's smaller than a protein. It's a hormone, but, uh, but also called a peptide. But we, when you give it in its native form as a medicine, it has a half-life of like minutes. So you'd have to have continuous infusion in your life to use GLP-1s in the human form as it was designed. And of course, we have plenty, we can make it ourselves um, inside our bodies, but if you give it exogenously or from outside, you need a drug that lasts longer than a few minutes. So you know, both companies set to work on that problem. It was actually Lilly that launched the first GLP-1 drug called Exenditide which was a strange story, another sidebar of a company discovered that in the saliva of a Gila monster. So this is the, the oh, those are lizard cool. that lives that. in yeah, the those desert. Are, yeah. 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 In their yeah. saliva is, a, is basically a, a mimic of the GL, human GLP-1. It's close, but not identical. Yeah. And the, the amino acid change that it had made for its purposes in saliva actually uh, prolonged its action in man to be more yeah. like six or seven hours. So right. this made for a twice a day injection and it was it allowed us to lower blood sugar in people with diabetes and it was super successful. It also, we noticed as happens in drug development that you lost a little bit of weight with this. And we know in type two diabetes, that was good. In the background, Nova was working on their own once a day version and they engineered it versus found it in nature. Then Lily, uh, made a once a week form called Dulaglutide, which is now marketed as Trulicity. And then Nova made a weekly one, which is called Ozempic, which we now all know the name of now. And actually, you know, in kind of a, not to nerd out too much on drug kinetics, but by going from daily to weekly, we were able to dose higher. And this is one of these situations where the glucose effect occurs at a lower dose than the weight loss effect. And we couldn't do that with a daily or twice a day drug because the side effects of these drugs, which are nausea and diarrhea, they're unpleasant, are kind of a, what we call a peak to trough effect. So you experience them when there's a big change in the drug in your body, but when it's steady state, you, we really reduce those symptoms. So mm. it was really uh, Novo's insight that we could push up the dose of semaglutide that allowed the obesity kind of threshold to be pushed. And then of course we followed that with our latest one, terzepatide, which is known as Manjaro, that's actually two hormones together. Yeah. Well, so so let me just um, take a step back, I, just for folks that are listening to really understand this. So all proteins are made from a chain, like a beaded necklace of amino acids being stuck together. And when they're put together, that chain kind of collapses into a, 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 a molecule, a structure, a protein structure. And that protein has some function because it's got shapes and curves on it and it can do things in the body, it can bind to things and it can do activities with different cells. But you don't necessarily need to use that exact chain of amino acids to get part of that protein to bind somewhere else in the body. You can use things that look like that protein and that's really the effort in all of these, what are called GLP-1 agonists, which are different than GLP-1 itself. They're different molecules, they're different proteins but they can bind and have the same sort of activity. So, so there's this discovery process, this research process, as I understand it, to, to develop and identify new proteins that can have 
a similar or perhaps even a more beneficial effect than GLP-1s in the body. Is that yeah. is that kind of fair? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think, you know, this story itself is going from like finding the native human hormone. And then we found this accidentally, this one in nature that was what we call yeah. an analog to it. So it had a similar function, but with a different kinetics, different absorption rate. And then Novo actually uh, engineered that in liraglutide. So they designed that in. And ever since then, we've been engineering in different changes in those amino acids, those beads, to drive different types of function. The latest one being this sort of dual acting one we have now, which like both right. ends, think of a chain with both ends with the active warhead versus just one end. Right. So over time in 1986, we kind of realized, hey, GLP ones stimulate insulin secretion. So this is super interesting and all this research begins. But since then, there have been a lot of studies on how GLP ones maybe are regulating and affecting other organs in the human body. And, you know, I've got this chart up here that shows the effect of GLP-1 um, and GLP-1 analogs on the brain, on the heart, on the pancreas, on the liver. There are all these kind of interesting follow-on effects. The human body is so difficult to kind of map everything, but there's some yeah. intricate relationship and cross-regulatory process that happens between all of these different systems of the human body. So maybe you can talk about the evolution in our understanding on how GLP-1s and GLP-1 analogs maybe are affecting other organs in the body, not just turning off hunger and not just making more insulin. Yeah, so of course it's doing those two things, but as you're pointing out, you know, the, the hormone is basically a messenger, right? So as, as you said earlier, it's telling your body you're fed. And with that, um, because nutrient absorption is like a survival instinct and um, we're pre-selected for that, we're good at then processing that signal and acting differently. So that includes, um, you see like heart rate going up and um, lipid levels dropping uh, in your cardiovascular system. And that's because you're responding to that food, the new nutrients entered into, into, into your body. Liver is a key part of metabolism. So there's tons of cross signaling into the, into the liver. Um, and the pancreas is the source of insulin amongst other metabolic regulatory hormones. So, so what we don't even fully understand yet though, David, which is interesting is, is that there are primary effects of GLP-1. Certainly we can reproduce like in a, in a, a test tube or a cell system, but then there's a whole myriad of other probably secondary effects because there might be intermediate signals we don't even know about yet in this whole metabolic process. So some of the ones listed here, I don't think have been proven as direct effects, many of the brain ones, for instance, but uh, clearly happen when you overstimulate GLP-1 or give it exogenously as a medicine. And uh, mostly in our nutrient-rich environment we covered earlier, these tend to be good things mm. because you're tamping down hunger and you're improving absorption of the nutrients you already have. Yeah. So now the topic du jour is, hey, we could use GLP-1s not just for the indication of obesity and diabetes, but perhaps for other health indications and maybe going after other yeah. issues that people uh, are having problems with. Yeah, I, th I think I think there's two big stories. One is that the other is that it turns out GLP-1 isn't the only hormone that matters. And you're going to, yep. I mean, we already have terzepatide, which is a whole nother hormone called GIP, uh, yep. glucagon insulinotropic peptide, which is a complicated name, but it has more of a bias toward fat release and basically allowing your fat cells to burn energy earlier in the starvation cycle. So as you're hungry, kind of unleashing fat energy versus just squeezing it out of our muscles, um, w which is what your body does naturally as kind of a survival instinct. And then we've combined that in terzepatide. Next up is uh, there's amylin-based drugs. That's another gut hormone uh, and glucagon, another one. So we, we've got uh, triple acting and all kinds of different ones coming. And that's a big part of the innovation story. I think we'll figure out through time which ones are best for what. Maintenance is a big issue in this class inducing more rapid weight loss in people who are super obese. You know, if you have a BMI of 50 and you take terzepatide, our drug, and you lose on average 23% of your body weight, you're still obese, right? So we, right. we need more potency for those people. But there's many people who have a BMI of 31 and heart risk. They can get their BMI to normal on terzepatide or semaglutide, but how do they keep it there more easily versus a weekly injection? So that's another problem being solved. Right. Anyway, the second thing, which you're touching on is, all the indications to go after 
And as I mentioned earlier, there's more than 200 diseases that are tagged to obesity. Do they all cause, are they all caused by obesity? We don't know that yet. They're correlated. But so far um, in our studies, this category of medicine is undefeated. We've never had an unsuccessful study in measuring an outcome in a chronic disease. And that's probably because we stacked the ones that were most possible first or most confident in. Um, but we're working down that list. Currently, Lily has 105 studies going with terzepatide in these other diseases. Wow. So this is a massive, massive undertaking. You know, a clinical trial like that takes 100 or $200 million each. So you can do the math. It's a, it's a huge bet that we can convert weight loss into sustained health benefit in chronic disease. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I'm doing the math. That's 10 to $20 billion you're spending on clinical trials yes. for, and I understand sleep apnea, maybe Alzheimer's, chronic kidney disease, sounds like lots of different indications where you yeah. go after a patient population, you try perhaps one of these combo therapies, these new combo therapies that you have. Yep. And, and then you, yeah, Manjaro. yeah, right. And then you see what the results are and if it works, yeah. So there's, then, there's then, one then we a just read out. A doctor can prescribe it, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's one we just read out, which we'll end up submitting. Which is um, there's a lot of people you and we all may know them in our life who say, "Oh, I was told I have pre-diabetes." Well, yeah. What is that? That's you know otherwise healthy middle-aged adults who are overweight, right? And yep. what happens? Diabetes, like a lot of diseases, it's not a binary function; it's a continuous function. Right. You you begin to have resistance to your own insulin because of the stress being put on your fat cells, essentially from overeating. And of course, reducing obesity might help that. And that's been tried without drugs, with you know uh, diet and exercise, and it works. So we replicated that re those results, and we just read that study out with Manjaro, which showed that three years on our drug, 94% fewer new diagnosis of outright diabetes. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge national health problem. And if we can treat diabetes uh, or obesity early in the life, we could potentially reduce diabetes downstream. Uh, so all there's many examples of these, but we're going for dozens and dozens of these kinds of use cases for the technology. So when that gets approved, when you go through your clinical trial, you get a positive indication on the the, the readout. A doctor can then prescribe that particular drug for that mm. that condition, and and then what? Insurance covers it. I mean, just help us understand kind of how how payment happens in this, yeah. and you know, ultimately, yeah. and then we'll talk a little bit about pricing in a second. Yeah. I mean, so that now we move from uh, clinical experiment and science to the messy part of healthcare. So, you know, in America, um, I think we have a, a strong bias to reimburse things that are kind of obvious. And when things are new, it, it's harder. What we see today with whether it be uh, Lily's products in this category or Novo's is really broad acceptance of by insurance and healthcare practitioners in treating outright diseases like diabetes, type two diabetes, and probably like these cardiovascular conditions we're studying. I think they'll be adopted quickly and reimbursed quickly, but that's when you already have the disease. Of course, the yeah. real promise here is to, pr to prevent those diseases, but in almost every case in this country, we don't really pay for prevention, right? So um, people who are obese and don't have those conditions, if you're say on Medicare, currently the rule of the federal government is they won't pay for these medications. You have to get diabetes before you can get the drug, which sounds pretty stupid, and I think it is. <laughs> but you know, yeah. the evidence needs, needs to build. Our job is to invest in that evidence base I just spoke about so that we can show time and time again that all these chronic illnesses can be abated, slowed, or even eliminated, and in some cases even reversed um, if we can get people to lose a dramatic amount of weight safely, which is what these drugs do. That's you know, in the process of sort of getting but, that idea yeah, adopted. Why, why is that um, controversial? Because if I'm an actuary underwriting the long-term cost of a patient or an individual in a, in a, in a program, an insurance program, I'm going to look at that patient, I'm like, or that person, I'm going to say, hey, if they stay overweight, there's going to be four diseases they're going to get over the next 30 years, and I'm going to have to pay for that. But if we can get them yeah. to lose the weight, I'm going to save all this money. Shouldn't I want, shouldn't I have a financial incentive, an economic incentive to, to change that? What's, what's the controversy there? Yeah, I think, you know, that's in process. I was actually in a big, you know, um, investor of mine's office a few weeks back and they said, oh, the, the last company in here was a reinsurance company and they're changing their actuarial tables yeah. for people who have, are on these drugs. 
which, you know, I was like, wow, you know, you're making a difference when, when that's happening, but it hasn't trickled through the system. I think there's a lot of still stigma associated with obesity, frankly, like social stigma and patients report to us. A lot of doctors won't even use these drugs because they're, they think it's a, it's a product of laziness. Um, and you know, why people become obese, we don't really understand completely yet why one person would and one person wouldn't. What we do know is once you become overweight or obese, losing that weight as an adult is really difficult. Mm. Some studies mm. show like less than 5% of people can reach a healthy body weight on diet and exercise once they're obese. So that's yeah, so, a very ineffective standard of care. So today, if I want to get trizepatide for a weight yeah. loss, which I think you guys call ZepBound, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, can I go to my, my health insurance company and have them pay for it or am I paying out of pocket? Depends on who you work for, Dave. So yeah, um, right. right now, about 50% of the employer-sponsored insurance plans cover it. Lily covers it. For, we, we cover the Nova ones too, um, because we think obesity is a, a disease. Those skew toward you know, companies with money, basically. Um, you know, I think health benefits are part, part of just attracting and retaining employees. Um, right. So smaller businesses, businesses with lower margins, like retailers, et cetera, really don't cover these meds yet. I think in five years, we'll look back and we'll say that was crazy. Um, once the evidence base is built up and there's more uh, adoption right. and less stigma, but right now that's the current state. So a lot of people do pay out of pocket and we've got some work to do to help them. You know, if you're the rule of the land in the U S is if you're insurance, uh, if you're in the federal benefit, um, you can't even accept, uh, the savings cards from the manufacturer. Oh, wow. But for those that have, have a commercial benefit, like if you work at an employer, a large employer, like a retailer that doesn't cover it, we can actually buy down your out of pocket costs. And we do that. And so did I hear correctly that you guys are doing a direct to consumer model as well? Is that right? Yeah. 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 So to get at this very problem of both stigma and the cost, you know, back um, in January, we launched what we call Lily Direct. So people can go to their doctor or use our telehealth platform. We have a bunch of partners who will see you as a physician and their obesity specialist, and they'll send the prescription to Lily and we'll fulfill it directly via mail, DTC. This solves two problems. One is people can go to a place where they're not stigmatized for being overweight. And two, they always get it at the same price and it's the lowest price available to them. There's a lot of confusion in retail pharmacy about what people should pay. And there's some pharmacies marking these drugs up because of the supply issues. Is it a thousand bucks a month? Is that right? For, um, for Zepan? List price. List price. List price. Um, uh -huh. We have a, a savings card program that's about $600 per month. And then we also just launched in the lowest two doses, uh, a vial form, which is a little easier for us to make. We can get into the supply issues here, uh, maybe in this discussion too. And that's um, $399 uh, basically and $550 for those yeah. two doses. So almost, you know, 60% off. Still a lot. So what about the criticism and the research that has shown that if you go off of one of these drugs, the weight comes back? And as a result, we're kind of going from a chronically ill population to a chronically drug dependent population. How do we address that concern? And you know, what is the change that's needed over time for that not to be the case? Isn't there an economic incentive for Lilly to always be, you know, hoping that more people need the drug more frequently because that's how you guys make money? And you know, how do we kind of talk about that change that's that's coming and and whether you need to be on it forever? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, our mission is to, is not what you said. Our mission is to solve human health problems. And ideally that would be here where people could have a course of therapy and then not have to take medicine. The, the physiology of GLP-1 and GIP right now, that's not how it works, right? If, if you don't have them on board, your body restores itself to its previous position. We, yeah. There is a theory that if you sustain low body weight for long enough, you can kind of reset your thermostat in a way and your body will stop trying to defend what it perceives as a starvation state, which is you, you're not carrying as much weight as you normally would. But you know we haven't had these drugs around long enough to prove that out. We also know that some people um, lose weight and then do change everything about their life to sustain that body weight and go off successfully. That's not uncommon, but it's not the most um, probable outcome for most. So for now, we need to take the drugs long-term. 
But we are working on drugs in our pipeline that do uh, seek to reset uh, the metabolic switch and using like the PYY as a mechanism, it's a brain mechanism that's thought that maybe you could have a treatment course, lose weight, and then reset um, your your self, uh, sort of that thermostat, if you will, of what yeah. your body's supposed to weigh. Um, we're working on this problem. But um, my, right my now understanding is like your base metabolism drops. So the number of calories per day that your body is burning to live goes yep. down. So if you stop taking the drug and the hunger switch gets slightly turned back on, even if you eat a healthy, normally healthy number of calories per day, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, you start to gain mm. weight again because your metabolism has declined. But what I've heard from a lot of friends, um, I don't want to call everyone a biohacker, but it definitely seems to be in kind of the people that like to mess around and try new things mm. uh, crowd is to kind of go on and off. So people are trying lower doses. They're, they're trying yeah. the drug for a period of time. They do it once a month, once a week. And then they kind of maintain a healthy weight without needing to be kind of um, on the, the typical regular cadence of the drug. Is that something you guys are seeing more frequently? Is that the steady state, do you think, over time? We definitely see that in in uh, in the clinic and in 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 practice by people. And you know, back to the cost. Of course, people want to spend less money, and if that works for them, you know, there's certainly um, and it's under doctor doctor supervision. We have no problem with that. We need to do more studies in the space. Uh, you know, what you have one drug on here uh, or not on here, which is coming, and it may be the most important drug because of the scale uh, um, ability, which is it's called orforglipron. It's a it's a chemical drug, so here not an amino acid, but a organic chemistry that mimics that mimics the activating uh, part of the peptide, um, and so it's a it's an oral GLP one. Um, in our hands, it, it's about as good as as high dose semaglutide, and wow. um, we, we're we're doing phase three right now. Um, so that will start to read out next year. The benefit of this is one, it's oral, so it's a little easier to take. You don't have to refrigerate. You don't have to worry about the injection. You know, some people don't like to inject, but the real thing is this is a this is a product for the masses because the systems we make these these drugs in now are complicated to scale, and that's why there's been shortages. You know, we have approvals in more than forty countries we haven't even launched in. That's not a normal thing for for a company you, that wants to you maximize. Can't, you can't make enough product. We can't make enough, right? Yeah. And because we yeah. want to satisfy the markets we've already launched in, so or Forgerpron, which is this phase three project, is super key in that um, we could both supply you know, people who could get away with just the one hormone drug, GLP-1, and we're studying it as a maintenance option as well, which makes kind of sense to go through the injection, lose more weight, and then keep it off with something uh, right. a little easier to take. What's yeah. your sense on how this is gonna affect the food industry? So a lot of analysts have talked about, hey, food companies are gonna get damaged by this. I'm gonna I'm an investor in a company called Supergut, and we have a uh, high resistant starch fiber product that we're now selling and having a lot of success selling as a complement to GLP-1. So you, you're, you're on a GLP-1 yeah. or GIP drug, you take this product and it kind of can help you during that period of time. And it's a new category that seems to be growing. A lot of companies are launching around this similar concept now. Do you think this is changing the food industry in the United States and in the West and ultimately around the world? And I don't know if you Absolutely. talk. Do you talk? Do you talk to CEOs of food companies? Do they call you and like, do. what are you doing yeah. to our business? Like, you know. yeah, I've got I've got uh, a couple on my board even. But, but so yeah. you know, I I think there are um, certainly displacing effects of this this category, and I, I think it's great news overall. First is the health things we talked about. So people will need you know uh, less diabetes products for sure. They'll need less other medicines. We're do, even doing study in like OA pain in the knee because a lot of knee replacements are in obese people mm. and it, they get painful early in life uh, knee pain. And we hope to show you can prolong that. So that's a sort of a knock-on effect. And then of course, food would be the next one you think about. I think you might know about the study, but last year Walmart did this sort of what's in the cart study yes, for people yes. on Ozempic or Manjaro. And it showed they were buying about a third less calories. So that's a lot, but that's consistent with how the drugs work. But interesting also, fewer salty snack foods. Yes. They're buying more fruits and vegetables, shopping yes. at the edge of the store versus the center. So that's happening probably because we only have 10 or 11 million Americans on these drugs. It's not happening in an economic scale that's really changing food companies' um, bottom lines. But, you know, enterprising companies like the one you mentioned, you know, protein shake companies, there's a yeah. lot of things happening. I went to a, a quick serve restaurant 
it was in California a few weeks back and they actually had a like a GLP-1 side menu. That's what yeah, it's called. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was exactly. like, if you're on these drugs, use these. Uh, so, you know, it is, it's having a big social uh, footprint. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's your stock price. So <laughs> Eli Lilly's stock, I think may outperform I don't know. It's probably pretty close. Uh, I, it, with NVIDIA, it's it's a, an, a, uh, an extraordinary stratospheric rise. Mm -hmm. And then just to look at how the business operates today. So you have this portfolio of products that you're developing, but in the last quarter, um, you did uh, 11 billion in revenue yeah. and generated um, 3 billion net profit. I think it's 3.7 of, of operating profit. One of the, 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 the key criticisms, um, and this is one of the things I wanted to get into, was how do you address and how do you deal with the political heat associated with your success? So you guys are operating a business that is having an extraordinary impact on people's lives, but you're also making an incredible amount of money. And in this environment today, that may be more challenging to deal with than it ever has been certain senators that we shall not name would look at this and say, hey, you're making an 81% gross margin selling these mm -hmm. products to sick people. How can you justify that? So maybe talk a little bit about how you deal with the political environment in the US, around the world, as you are successful and are projected to triple the business over the next couple of years here. Yeah, well, it's, it's obviously a top of list issue for me every day. Maybe a couple things there, Dave. So, I mean, first of all, this is a very long investment cycle business. Um, as we talked about earlier, like we launched the first GLP-1 drug in the world in 2005. And since that time, we've been working for, you know, this kind of performance because we took risk against that idea, right? And refined it and worked that problem. And that, it, you know, I think that time scale is hard for people to think about, but also, you know, the dollar scale of the R&D. This year, we'll spend over $11 billion on R&D which is a meaningful, uh, it's like a nation state scale. Like it's more than the country of Germany. Um, so we, we're pushing forward new medicines based on the revenue of today's medicines. And that virtuous cycle is sometimes just hard to articulate, but when you get it right, you can have a big societal impact. So that's the first thing. Secondly, you know, I think the pressure is a privilege in a way. It means we made something useful enough that a lot of people need it and want it. And now our job is to work with you know, the healthcare system to sustainably adopt it. And we do th see that as our responsibility to work with, you know, politicians, if that's who we work with, or um, health plans or employers to find a way to get this medicine, which we think is amazing, terzepatide, to so many people um, and do it in a way that's sustainable. Now, hopefully we've created enough value that the certainly the, the people who are getting the drug are benefiting that the health plans are actually lowering costs in the long term, even that there may be an increase in the short term, and that we make a reasonable profit for our shareholders and sustain R&D for the future. So I think that's what's happening here. I think this week, actually, Novo Nordisk, our competitor, was hauled before Congress to talk about this issue. Um, yeah. There's a lot of other dysfunctions in the U.S. system that we could talk about in terms of how inefficient healthcare is. I mean, here's a medicine that could augment 100 200 adult diseases in a meaningful way. It's expensive, yes. Probably net pricing uh, for us, you know, is going to be something like three, four thousand dollars a year in the steady state per person. But I think we'll create more value than that. We'll save the system more money than that per year per user. Um, yeah, that's what we should well, be aiming I for. I think what's interesting about it is the 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 pro the, the biologic products are the the, the the molecules are advancing. And they're advancing in a in a, a a pretty kind of steady way. The issue, I think, with insulin, and, and there's obviously been a lot of legislation and regulatory and uh, political scrutiny mm -hmm. around insulin pricing, is it's the same molecule, and the price has just gone up. Right? This is this is the old kind of pharmaceutical companies are bad story. Is they've got a product that they make for ten yep. cents, and then they sell it for ten bucks. Then someone says, "Let's charge a hundred. They're like, "Okay, let's charge a hundred. And so yep. it's classified as price gouging. In this particular market, you guys are certainly making a healthy market, but the products are also advancing. There's new combination therapies coming out and uh, the oral therapy. So there's a lot of investment in improving the overall landscape of what's possible. It, yeah, let me address and, that. And, and, because I, I took yeah. over in early 17, as you mentioned, and like that, the insulin pricing scandal, which Novo and Lilly were also center of, right, yep. was um, hot and heavy. 
And I, so I took a lot of personal lessons from that. But, you know, every day since that, we had reduced the price of insulin, even though, you know, we have this weird system in the U.S. where a lot of our two thirds of actually our gross price goes to PBMs and insurance companies. So right. of the gross price that's often quoted, the net for us is about uh, a third of that. And in right. insulin, it was even more. Where does that money go? Well, it's used often to cross subsidize other things in healthcare. So we have to unwind that system if we really want to value innovation. And then the other thing, which is in this chart, is uh, and I mentioned, is some of that revenue from insulin we use to invest in the next generation of therapy, whether it be insulins, which we're still investing in new insulins, or GLP-1 drugs, which of course we did. Um, and that is hard to articulate in the moment, but it actually produces good economic and social value later. Yeah. Here, though, we, we took those lessons. We launched at a 20% discount to Nova's product, even though we have better efficacy data. And we've only cut the price since then. Mm. And I think um, we see a kind of a generational opportunity for the company to both be, have the best product, so efficacy and quality, but also mass production. And that requires yeah. a pricing strategy consistent with that. Well, you've also invested a lot in manufacturing in the United States, right? Yeah. Didn't you just do like a $5 yeah. billion dollar investment in Indiana to build new facilities? Um, yeah, we're building so, the largest API site in the history of the United States in Indiana. Yeah, so it's yeah, a huge... So that's, I mean, that's got to feel good to the politicians too, that this isn't like yeah. uh, optimizing for cost, but there's also infrastructure being built. So I've got a lot of numbers on forecast, breakdown of product. I think like what's interesting is just, I don't know if these numbers seem right, but the analysts are projecting that your 2026 operating income numbers could grow to $32 billion. I mean, it's just such an incredible rise. And that obviously is the the pipeline of indications, the pipeline of combo therapies, new modalities, and that's up from 7 billion last year, I believe, right? So 4X in three years at the scale of operating income, it's really incredible. I hope they're right. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope mean, look, right. good, good for yeah, you. working I, hard I, on this. Yeah. I heard that there was like internal forecasts that I won't reveal my source uh, and all the forecasts got kind of blown out. Like the, <laughs> the forecasts were too conservative uh, in terms of where you guys yeah. are at with trisepatide. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if you did. So if we look look at the breakdown of Lilly's portfolio of revenue today, mm -hmm. uh, it's very obvious that what we've just been talking about, the GLP-1, GIP drugs are the vast majority of the portfolio and expected to be the vast contributor of growth in the years ahead. But maybe you can tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about how you think about the portfolio of other opportunities to address disease and how you're investing there and how, you know, when you've got such a blockbuster like this and you've got a runaway train and you can't keep up with demand, how do you dedicate resources to the rest of the portfolio? And how do you think about that as a CEO, as a leader in yeah. getting your team to focus on other things that are also very important? Yeah, yeah I, I think, I mean, that's a key thing we'd spend a lot of time with our board on. And, you know, on the one hand, um, I think there's a lot of business books you could read that say, well, double down on your winners, right? And just keep going. But unlike other industries, you know, they, we don't really have a franchise value at the end of the patent life, right? There, when, when drugs go off patent, you have to actually have a better drug that competes with almost free. Yeah. And that's probably possible one or two times here. We're talking about Monjaro. Trulicity, our last, our GLP-1 only, and semaglutide's GLP-1 only, will go generic. And we think we have enough differentiation to keep growing through that. But at some point, that story runs out. Right. And so on a time scale of decades, you need other lines in the water. Um, in a lot of ways, this is like an options business. You know, we, we, we have to lay down bets across a variety of things. They have to be, you know, real unmet medical needs that you can get paid if you have a solution for, but also, you know, the technology bet, is it going to work and how to attack that? So my mindset is we have to walk and chew gum at the same time here. We have to execute like nobody else against this enormous kind of not, not even generational, maybe longer opportunity to build a company, affect human health and re return capital to shareholders. At the same time, we, Lily's been around 148 years. Um, I think we have an obligation to our newest employee who just joined to have a business by the time they get to a senior level. And we certainly have a role in the world changing human health. So we are investing pretty broadly in cancer and immunology 
maybe in brain disease is the most important area we can invest more in, mm. um, because I think that's actually becoming more tractable and is about 40% of global suffering is some form of a brain or, or um, neuroscience disease. And we have a lot of expertise there. So a little bit of balance and a lot of focus simultaneously. And, and we divide our organization so that we have four business leaders. And one of them is this franchise we were just talking about, weight loss and cardiometabolic health. Three others have other agendas and yeah. their job is to compete and win that way. Uh, yeah. I'm proud that I mean, actually in Q2, Q2, our non-Incretin, our non uh business grew 17% on a pretty big base. So that's a healthy business as well. More on the scale of a regular pharma company, not the supersized uh, thing we've become. What are you, what science are you excited about? I don't know if you're a, a big science nerd um, as oh, yeah. much, but you have like oh, yeah. so the Incretin products are, um, you know, uh, it's peptide manufacturing. But obviously, there's uh, g- uh, cell therapies, so programming cells yeah. to go into the body and do things. There's gene therapies where we have all sorts of mechanisms for altering gene expression and making, you know, permanent changes in, in, in human cells. And, um, and then there's all this interesting stuff in that, that I'm super fascinated by and excited by in like Yamanaka factors, these factors that can have a profound effect yeah. on the epigenome, uh, which can ultimately change how, how cells behave and radically affect the process of aging or what we consider to be aging. What else are you excited yeah. about? What's exciting in the portfolio? And how do you invest internally versus do M&A versus venture to kind of access those interesting, you know, areas. Yeah. Well, let me talk about the science and I'll get to the investment strategy, but it, uh, we've talked about diseases here, but, you know, we think about our, our role is like having a palette of ways to make medicines, which are basically, you know, new molecular matter against uh, a set of diseases we know something about. That's sort of when those things converge, we do well. So what's in the palette? I think that's been expanding rapidly lately. And I think this whole new field of genetic medicine, which you talked about, um, like ex vivo gene therapy, where you edit cells and they go do things like CAR T's, or uh, gene edits themselves or gene inserts, which are exciting. You know, we had a um, medicine where we announced results this year that is focused on inner ear diseases of deafness, basically congenital deafness disorders that are monogenic. Um, and we, we've treated patients that have gone from like six, eight years of life, no hearing at all to now hearing. I mean, this is, it is Lazarus like when you see it, but the, you know, I think the thing that excites me is when you can do amazing things at massive scale. So those two techniques, CAR T and gene therapy, it's hard to think of like super scaled millions of people benefiting. One new family of medicines I'm excited about are the so-called siRNA. This is where we can knock down proteins that are aberrant or causing problems and do it pretty safely and surgically um, and do it very infrequently. So like we have a project in phase three right now that knocks down uh, the production of something called LP little a, which is a lipoprotein particle that's probably thought to be about 25% of the remnant reasons why we still have cardiovascular disease. And there's no medicine for it today. This is promises to be a once a year dose and so you take this once a year and it's catalytic in sales and it works and just keeps knocking down this protein. So if that translates into outcomes, I think that makes for a very scalable business. We could treat millions or a billion people with a medicine like that and have a big, big effect. So we're playing around with that toolbox um, extensively these days. So scale has yeah. to, scale matters, right? And then- that, Well, that's our strat. I think that's what yeah. Lily's for, right? Is to make yeah. things that aren't boutique, but things that are uh, everywhere. So, you know, how do we do this? I mean, we, we, we have focused maybe more than anyone else on a lot of small deals. That starts with our corporate venture group. So we have one of the most scaled corporate venture operations in all of corporate America. Hundreds and hundreds of bets that are small in size. Usually we go in with, you know, with GPs as an LP and invest in small biotechs pre, pre uh, public. And there we don't have to be so right. Mostly we're trying to learn and follow science and have a seat at the board or a seat at the table so that when things start to turn, we can move early. Um, we do a lot of M&A last year. So sorry, so sorry you're, you're, both an, you're both an LP in venture funds and you write checks direct. Is that right? Yeah, both ways. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. We also have an interesting project we're growing. I'm quite called Catalyze 360. And here the idea is beyond money. 
what else can we do to help incubate small companies? And so we have both space, but also a service layer we're offering, sometimes in a cost plus way, or sometimes for downstream royalties, where you know we're a big capable company. When you're building a new company, like you've been doing in, in um, ag, like sometimes you need something that's a pain in the ass to go build. You have to either buy a consultant or hire one person, and you only need them for a few, few months. So here we're stepping in and saying, well, we'll give you that consult. If you need to interpret a tox result, like right. you can just call Lily's experts. So we're like a service layer to cultivate kind of this ecosystem around us. And then we do M&A. We buy companies last year, about two dozen, which was the most of any pharma company, but actually with some of the least capital deployed. So we're making, um, I think we spent $3 billion on 24 companies. So we're making lots right. of small bets. Right. And I think that is interesting because the longer we have uh, residents, you know, sort of uh, in a partnership or we own something, we can add more value. It also allows us to trade in front of the de-risking event. When things get de-risked in our sector, there's a huge inflection in value. Yeah. And so you're basically paying the last shareholders, not yourself. Um, we think we can bet better than the market on what those, the probability of something converting to, to a success is. And if we're right about that, we'll we'll be better off buying early. Yeah. Well, so as a lot is changing at the company and you're you're at the scale you're at and growing as fast as you are, how do you think about? And this was an important one I wanted to talk about: leadership and culture. I've uh, uh, someone that works with me at Ohalo. Uh, her name's uh, Megan. She worked at at Lilly for years, and so we had a long chat about mm. this interview a few days ago. And she talked to me about how great the culture is and. 10,000 people on campus in Indianapolis, and it feels like a college campus. There's a track and field. There's a bar yeah. on campus, all these sort of things yeah. that make it a great place to work. And she was really torn, by the way, in making a choice to go back to Lily or joining me. So I apologize that we that we took her. But um, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, maybe tell me a little bit about how you kind of think about culture, keeping people uh, aligned, motivated, keep the performance culture strong as you're kind of trying to execute at this extraordinary scale. Yeah. Exceptional question. I mean, that's of the things I worry about long-term. This is one of them. How do we keep what's so good about how we operate? I mean, the background of the company is important. It's an old company, right? And it was family run for a hundred years. Like it was one of the few exceptions in corporate America where the third generation didn't totally screw it up. Actually, they made it quite a a bit, (laughs) quite a bit better. Um, And because of that, I think there's a lot of loyalty and social cohesion in the company. As you mentioned, like We like coming to work and being together. It's a friendly place, but also scientifically super rigorous. Um, And that's that's often not two things that fly well together. So I think it's got a lot of exceptional attributes. When I started though, I think in my kind of view of like, when you're running a big ship like this, probably changing the culture is like beyond your your capability. But what you can do is like turn up the things that are good and turn down the things that are less good. And we've been cultivating that. So like one thing that was less good, but is now really clicking for us is sort of like use our scale or enterprise wide capability as a, as a benefit, not a, not a, a detractor. So many companies get big and get bureaucratic and terrible. Like, I mean, they just can't get out of their own way. Totally. And we really lean into, okay, it's everyone's job to solve for Lily first. It's everyone's job to get the patient healthy. Now let's talk about our departments as a derivative of that, not the main goal. And somehow those things get flipped around in big companies and people focus on how they look or who's, which department's best and none of that matters. And we have to emphasize that. Another thing I've really focused on is speed at scale. Mm. And we measure that rigorously. That's more of an engineering thing. I mean, we really track things very carefully on speed and we've moved the drug development timeline, which the industry is about nine years from first human dose to FDA approval. And when I started, ours was about 11. And now we're 6.1. So how did you do, how did you do, how did you incentivize that? How did you reward that and create the model yeah. for individuals like to contribute we, to that goal? Yeah. Kind of one big idea and then a thousand little things. The big idea mm-hmm. is like this ratchet mindset that every time we beat a timeline, that becomes the new norm. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. we like just rebenchmark internally. And when we were at 11 and everyone's as at nine, everyone wants to jump to be, okay, let's be industry average. But that's actually quite hard in a big company. So we just said, okay, if it, we have a submission document to get in. And it used to be our standard was 120 days from when you had the data to when you send it to the FDA. We're now doing that routinely inside of two weeks. Yeah. So we've basically taken 80% of the time out. 
But that came in lots of little bites. But overarching, everyone who works in development knows it's about time to patient. That's the yeah. that's the big idea. Solve for that. So yeah, that's you know those are some of the kind of culture dynamics we we deal with. And of course, we want to attract new people. We've expanded dramatically on the coast our science operations. Like if you go, you know, South San Francisco is now a pretty big campus for us. We yeah. just built a huge building in Seaport, Boston, that'll hold 500 genetic scientists. So for some domains, we need to go where the people are um, and be a yeah. more of a kind of a mothership with satellites versus having everyone here in Indianapolis. And do you, and I know we got to wrap in a minute, but, uh, and do you worry about AI? There's a lot of startups with very smart people that have built uh, LLMs and other models that are now trying to apply those learnings and develop new systems for discovery of molecules that will have some particular action and doing it all in silico rather than searching through the domain space of molecules that we're either synthesizing or we're discovering in nature. And is that a partnership for you at Lilly because you guys can operate at scale and manufacture and distribute and market? Or is that a disruptive force that could really damage the the 20 year out kind of horizon for Lilly's business? How much do you really think or worry about this? Oh, we spent a lot of time on this. Uh, you know, of course, we have our own efforts, um, pretty significant AI efforts internally, and a lot of partnerships, including with you know OpenAI and Microsoft, uh, a- Amazon, et cetera. Um, all basically all the the large scale players, Google Isomorphic. So yeah. we have to pay a lot of attention to it. Here's what I noticed so far: is there's a lot of money. I think last year five billion with a B went into new venture backed tech bios, you know, that's what yep. they like to call themselves. Yep. And that money is coming not so much from the traditional bio VC world, but from the tech world, which is people. got that's a lot right. more, lot more to right. splash around, right? That's right. But a lot of those, I think, if you look at their, their pitch decks, they're really saying, oh, we're going to invent, we're going to run the whole process in silico. And I, I think that's really naive, actually. Um, yep. And what I think will end up in the medium term being very valuable is more the tool builder approach. Like yeah. we can take a process like ADME. So that's where you're trying to optimize chemical properties of a drug, like we we're talking about GLP-1. So it's not twice a day, it's once a week. And there, I think by chunking problems smaller, the machines can really help a lot more. We have more data on some specific acute use cases and um, we can have a tighter loop between the experiment in the, on the bench and the data process behind the the model learning. The idea that you're gonna throw on, you know, turn a switch on a computer and it's gonna think about something and invent, you know, the next Prozac, I don't know. I, I think we're a long way from that day. Yeah. But we'll we're paying attention to all of it. Yeah. So wet lab and clinic integration is critical. It's not all gonna be in silico. There's gonna be a a, a a good chunk of the time. Yeah, it's a co-pilot model where the machine can do predictions. Probably now where we see the most value is eliminating bad ideas that humans don't see, but in hindsight look obvious. So yeah. like, cause you can integrate a lot of multi-source data and say the probability of this working based on prior experiments is like 2%. Yeah. And yeah. there's human factors where scientists like their, their last idea the most, but also we have trouble seeing across all this field domains of data. Machines are good at that. That, that can add value immediately. Awesome. Well, are you glad you took the job seven and a half years ago? Or uh, what are you most happy about? And what's the biggest disappointment? Last uh, last question here as we wrap up. Yeah, of course. I mean, what an honor yeah. to yeah. lead a company like this at this moment. Um, we all need to get better all the time. I mean, I, I find myself disappointed mostly by, by not being prepared, not thinking in advance of, of things. But, you know, it's... Um, when you miss we something. We become a kind of a... yeah. That looks obvious in hindsight, which we all have. Yeah. It's a complicated business. I, you know, I should give myself grace on it, but it happens more often than I would hope. And I, I think that staying humble about that is like one of the most important things that successful CEOs can do. I mean, you always have to learn and you always have to learn from your own mistakes. That's something we talk about a lot here. I, you know, I think it's, it's cool that we've become more of a cultural icon. That's cool, but it's also a big responsibility because like you said, with the Lily Direct, and you know, being more of a consumer household name, people expect a lot more of us. And yeah. we've got to change from being just like a Midwestern quiet medicine company to something a lot more. And we're not there yet. We have to, we have to get better. So yeah, yeah more to do. Okay. No, great. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today, Dave. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And I wish you the best of luck with Lily. Congrats on, on all the success. 
Thanks a lot. We'll have to have, have you come out to our lab sometime. I will. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, next time I'm in the Midwest, I will certainly take you up on that. I'd love to come visit. Be awesome. Yeah, awesome. Ooh.